السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد First thing is that I must uh, express uh, my, my profound happiness to find out that this is, uh, as the brother said, a certified Somali masjid. In North America, in Canada, or in the United States, any major Somali conference, I'm always invited. And my love for the Somali people is very, very well known. No doubt. I love the Somali people. I love any gathering where 80% of the people are Somali. You guys are very serious Somalis here. <laughs> and yani, my, the, the way I describe Somalis, I say they are the greatest people on earth, right after the Sudanese people. Okay, that didn't work either, huh? So you guys, you know, look, again, one more, I have to say this every lecture. I've been here now four weeks, and I have one more week to go, inshallah. And you British people are so serious. La ilaha illallah. You tell a joke, everyone's like this. So relax, yeah, we'll be friends for this lecture, be non-British, non and then after the, this lecture is over, be British again, okay? Wonderful. طيب. So the title of the lecture is Speak Good. And it's a wonderful title because it's taken from the hadith of our Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, where he said, مَنْ كَانَ يُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ فَلْيَقُلْ خَيْرًا أَوْ لِيَصْمُطْ Whoever believes in Allah and the last day, then he should say that which is good, or keep quiet. Say that which is good, or keep quiet. And this is such a fantastic hadith. And if we could just implement this hadith. You know, most people now, they have to say something. And it's praise to just, يعني, oh, he, speak your mind. يعني, is there something wonderful that comes out of your mind, or is just some, some rude comment, or rude statement, or something like that? So that means then we're gonna be talking about the tongue. And talking about the tongue is a very important subject, because the tongue itself, the description of the tongue is that it is a small and dangerous instrument. You guys with me? The tongue is a small and dangerous instrument. And it's an instrument, I mean, it's a muscle really, isn't it? The, the tongue, it's a small muscle, it's very small, but it never ever gets tired, true or false. You guys are better pay attention, hey. You guys in the front here, pay attention. Wuriya, ilahi ka'abso. All right? So, <laughs> I told you I love Somalis, man. So. The tongue is a small and dangerous instrument. What is so dangerous about it is that it never gets tired, ever. And it, you know sometimes you're like, you eat a lot, and you keep swallowing, you know, so your throat hurts or something. Your jaw is hurt from chewing. You talk a lot, maybe your jaw hurts, but your, your tongue never hurts. Anyone in here ever experienced where the tongue hurt? Yeah, like your tongue is tired from speaking too much? Never happens, isn't that amazing? It's a muscle that just doesn't get tired. Well, as you're speaking, it's flying up and down and going left and right and up and down and you never, never get tired. So this is now, we have a recipe for disaster. You want to hear a recipe for a disaster? Number one, the tongue doesn't get tired. Number two, few people are able to restrain it. Few people are able to keep it back, to hold their tongue. And number three, it is one of the most dangerous things, one of the most dangerous tools. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam explained in one hadith on the Day of Judgment, the whole body will be angered at the tongue. You put us in this trouble. You put us in this problem. It's the tongue. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, he said, I asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa of the two things that will most take people to the hellfire. Yani, the people who go to the hellfire. What is the main reason they go to the hellfire? Qala al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa al-famu wal-farj. Al-famu wal-farj. The mouth and the sexual organs. These are the two, two things that will most take people into the hellfire wal billah the mouth and the sexual organs. Then, to complete the hadith, Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu asked the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what of the two things will most take people to paradise? And he said, taqwa Allah wa husnul khuluq. Taqwa Allah wa husnul khuluq. Being, having taqwa of Allah, yani being yani, God conscious, God fearing, and husnul khuluq, good manners. So we see here the tongue one of the top two things that people to take people to the hellfire will ayyadu billah and one of the top two things that take people to paradise. You see the place and the danger of the tongue. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever guarantees for me what is between his lips, what is that? What's between your lips? Meaning the tongue. I will guarantee for them paradise. That's how serious it is. Just, if you can just hold that tongue, 
It'll, it'll help and guarantee paradise for you. Just hold that tongue. It shows you how dangerous it is. And in the very famous hadith of Al-Muflis, the, the person who is bankrupt, and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was sitting with his companions. Everyone with me? I, I think this hadith is more interesting than what he's doing. Everyone with me? Yeah? Some good stuff here because it's the, the speech of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's why. He said uh, to his companions, Do you know who is the one who is bankrupt? Muflis. They said, المفلس, Ya Rasulullah, Al Muflis Ufina, Man la dirham alahu wa la dinar. Ya Rasulullah, the Muflis, the one who is bankrupt amongst us, is the one who has no dirham, no currency, and he's, and he, or, or in la dirham alahu wa la mata'a, another narration. He has no money and he has no possessions either. This is the person who is bankrupt. Then the Prophet ﷺ explained to them that the bankrupt is the person who comes forth on the day of judgment with a mountain of good deeds, a lot of good deeds that he did from the acts of worship and things like that. But he also He has insulted this person and hit that person and took the wealth of that person. So we see bad manners from this person. We see insults from this person. What happens to him? So this person will take from his good deeds and the other person will take from his good deeds. He had a mountain, right? And now this mountain is getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And then when he has no more good deeds left because of his bad manners, there's still a long line of people that want to get something from him and he's got no more good deeds to give them. So then he begins to take from their bad deeds. Then the Nabi Wasallam describes he will be thrown into the hellfire. Al-Iyadu Billah. You know, if you want this hadith to be more dramatic, you recognize and realize where this happens. And this happens in front of the gates of Jannah. So this man made it through all, with all his good deeds through many of the stages of Al-Qiyamah, the day of judgment, until he got in front of the gates of Jannah. But before it's opened, if the believers have problems amongst themselves, it's going to be settled in front of Al-Jannah. And so they call him and he has a mountain of good deeds that he got from Salah and Siyam and giving charity and doing all kinds of good deeds. He lost all that because he had a bad relationship with people. He had a good relationship with Allah, hence his mountain of good deeds. He had a bad relationship with people, hence he lost the mountain of good deeds and he gets their bad deeds and is thrown into the hellfire. So from this we see the importance of the behavior of the Muslim, the conduct of the Muslim with other believers as well with other people, any other human beings, with humanity. And it's not enough to say, you know, I'm going to have a good relationship with Allah and if I have a, good rela a bad relationship with people, it's okay. It's, what, it's with Allah that counts and that is not the case. So we see from this hadith the importance of holding the tongue as well and the danger of the tongue. Luqman, you know Luqman? Luqman al-Hakim, he was a wise man. Yeah, a lot of the scholars believe he was a wise man and not a prophet. He was a wise man and he used to be a slave. So when he was a slave, it is narrated that he was, even as a boy, he was wise. Listen up, you guys, yeah? He was a he young man like you guys. He was very wise. One day his master gave him a sheep. He said, take it, slaughter it, and bring me the, the, the best two parts of it. Okay? The best two parts from the sheep. So Luqman took the sheep, he slaughtered it, and he brought him back the heart and the tongue. Is he wise or what? These are the best parts of the animal, yeah? The heart and the tongue. Then after a while, his master gave him another sheep. He said, swallow it, um, slaughter it, yeah? Swallow it later. Slaughter it for now, and bring me the worst two parts. And he brought him, you guys tell me, he brought him the worst two parts of the sheep. The, the what? The bladder? I like you. You're going to study medicine? Yes, you said? I like you. The tongue is the best part and the worst part? Yeah, this guy's Hakim, mashallah. And what's the other part? Sexual, <laughs> Sexual organs. Look at this guy. <laughs> Naam? Just like the tongue. Just like the first part. The heart. You see his wisdom? So he brought him the tongue and the heart again. Yani he's sending him a message. He was wise. He was saying, these are the best parts, but they can also be the worst parts. And it's kind of like what we saw in the hadith, right? Taqwa Allah, husn al-khuluq. Yeah? It's kind of like that, actually. So, so the tongue we established now, it's dangerous, and few people restrain it, and it's one of the things that pay, take people to the hellfire, wal-ayadu billah. And one of the things that also will take people to paradise if it is utilized properly. What does the tongue do? What are the sins of the tongue? There's so many. 
lying, backbiting, spreading rumors and lies and you know, things of that sort, using bad words, cursing, cussing. All these things are from the dangers of the tongue and from the sins of the tongue. Let's start with lying. You know, this study was written, uh, was, was done in the United States, and we can give a discount for British people. But they say in the United States, the average child lies five to six times a day. And the average adult lies two to three times a day. We'll make a discount for Britain. The average adult lies two times a day. Huh? Okay, we knocked off one lie. So, يعني, the hadith of the Nabi Sallallahu that يعني, the Prophet said in the that a man will be truthful and he will continue to be truthful until he is written with Allah as a truthful person. So his label with Allah is that he's truthful. Yeah? Now and then the other man would يكذب, he would lie. And he would continue to lie. Until he will be written with Allah as a liar. So here's the question. If you're sitting in this room right now, and you lie, occasionally, you know, or from Eid to Eid, or from Jum'ah, whatever, you, from Eid to whatever is your, your pattern of lying. If you lie daily, if you lie every other day, if you lie in this room, how would you feel if someone started to call you the liar? How would you feel if the people in the masjid know you, know you as Al-Kadhab? How would that make you feel? Who would like that? Yeah. They, people call you, hey, salam al kadhab kif halak al kadhab Kadhab means the liar, by the way. The liar. That's your name. Everyone's like, kadhab, barakallahu fi kifak al kadhab Kif umurak al kadhab How are you feeling, al kadhab How would you feel? You get very upset, extremely upset, right? Don't you dare call me al kadhab again. Wait a minute, but don't you lie every now and then? Yeah, I lie every now and then. So you're a kadhab then? Allah, how does that hurt, huh? It hurts, doesn't it? Imagine, forget people. Imagine when Allah looks at you, you're written and labeled as al kadhab So every time Allah looks at you, He sees al kadhab How do you feel now? You see how wicked and how bad it is to lie now? You know, when you, when you look at this, this, these meanings, these ma'ani, these hadith, you think, you know what? I don't care what happens in this life. I'm not going to lie until I go to my grave. Yani, come what may. I don't care. I'm not going to lie. Don't you feel that? I'm not going to lie to people and be written as a liar with Allah. Khalas, I'll tell the truth from, from now on until I go to my grave, inshallah, Azza wa Jal. Isn't that the natural decision to make right now, isn't it? I don't want to ever lie. Forget this, I'll be labeled a liar with Allah, Azza wa Jal. You know, I had this fantastic khatib. He, he had a, gave a khutbah about lying. Man, everyone in the masjid was like this. What was he talking about? Strong khutbah. And he would say, listen to me, you liar. If you're sitting here in the audience and you lie, you liar, this khutbah is for you. Everybody felt uncomfortable. And no one came to him at the end of the khutbah. Zakal I really enjoyed your khutbah. Only Abu Bakr Siddiq would say that, right? <laughs> Someone who's Siddiq, right? So you want to be truthful with Allah Azza wa Jal. You want to be known as a truthful person with everybody else. Yeah? You know, we teach our children to lie. We teach our children to lie. Parents teach their children to lie. When the child tells the truth, what happens? Punishment. Beating. What do you say in Somalia? You say, take the bones and give us the meat. Are you guys real Somalis or are you fake Somalis? Some of you are fake Somalis. No, I think you two, obviously, are Pakistani. Man. You're not, you know, I'm looking for the black folks in here. You're Somali? Pakistani. Yeah, I know that. <laughs> I wasn't mistaking that you're from Mogadishu or something. Okay, so you guys are not real Somalis here, unfortunately. Real Somalis know when, yeah? Sheikh, you know, you're a real Somali, man, no? When you give your child, okay, you guys are from the UK. Khalas, ma fi mushkila. You guys embarrassed me. When there is some old, when, when you take your child to, this, to the teacher in Somali, what do you say to the teacher? You say, take the bones and give us the meat. Sa, ma sha Allah. Sheikh here recognizes it. Which means what? <laughs> Beat him, break the bones, just give us meat at the end of the day. In Sudan, we have the exact opposite. When you give your child to the teacher, you say, take the meat and bring us the bones. And you whip him, whip him, take all the meat from whipping. I know this is really cruel, like how did we get into this? Yeah, but I'm coming to a point. So take all, whip him and just give us bones at the end of the day. And muhim. So we now we have now whipping and we have bone breaking. And muhim. The point is, how did I get into that? What was I saying? Yeah, we teach the children to lie, صح? So you, the child, Tell us the truth, what, is, what happens? He gets a beating, he gets punishment. Bones, <laughs> destroy the bones if he tells the truth. If he lies, 
what happens? You let him go. So what does he learn? He learns that it's good to lie. You get saved if you lie. And if you tell the truth, you get in trouble. Is that a good lesson? It's a horrendous lesson. It's a very bad lesson. That's why for the parents in the audience, we say, look, if your child lies, punish them. And if they don't lie, if you tell the truth, even if they burnt the house, if they tell you the truth, don't punish them. Yeah? This is the best thing to do. Because then they don't associate punishment with telling the truth. Then they start to lie. So we teach our children to lie. And we make excuses for lying and we color lies. Do you color lies in the UK? You have white lies also? Yeah, okay. So we have white lies. We have all kinds of colored lies and Eid lies and Jum'ah lies and Sabbath lies and Ahad lies. No excuse for lying. You lie and you're labeled like that with Allah. How does that make you feel? So lying is part of the dangers of the tongue. And if we can restrain ourselves from lying. Likewise, there is backbiting. And backbiting, mashallah, people have excuses for backbiting. Yeah, this is some of the excuses for backbiting. I can say this to his face. Tabiakhi, go say it to his face. Why are you saying it behind his back then? You think yani, the fact that I'm able to say it to his face makes it not backbiting? No, it's backbiting. Or some other brothers, they're more talented. They start speaking about a brother and then like, they don't know. By the way, is this backbiting? Yani, if it's backbiting, I'll stop. What do you think it is? Do you see him here? Taib is backbiting. Yani, would you, let me just check it yani, from a fiqh standpoint. Is this backbiting? Oh, oh, oh mashallah. Yeah? You're giving it this really yani, knowledge kind of covering for her. Huh? No excuses for backbiting. No excuses for it. And Allah likened it to eating the flesh of your brother while he's dead. Would any of you like to eat the flesh of his brother? You know something? We used to do this, yeah? We used to imagine, yani when, when some people are speaking about someone, do this, it helps you a lot. If you're in a gathering, let's say with four or five brothers, and they start backbiting about someone, this is what will help you, this visual. Imagine that brother that they're backbiting about, imagine him on the table in front of you, or on the floor, cold and dead and pale in color, gray in color, his skin is no, has no color, and now each one of you will take a piece of his, meaning cut it like this, and you... MashaAllah, this brother very flexible. This brother, wallahi, ya juicy. Imagine that. How does that visual fit? Horrible, right? One of, the, one of the scholars, he invited some people for his house for, for, yani, for food. So he, he, brought the, he brought out yani, some of the, the bread, and now he's going to go get the meat. So they start backbiting on someone. So he wants to tell them indirectly, stop backbiting. He said, SubhanAllah, people before you used to eat the bread before the meat. But you guys are starting with the meat. You understand? You know what that means? And you see you're already eating the flesh of your brother. <laughs> we didn't even start. The bread didn't even come. You start with meat immediately. Yeah? Kind of like how we are now. <laughs> now, I mean like really, when there's a meal, we start with the meat, don't we? Yeah? Did someone die before I just came here or what? <laughs> yeah? You had the janazah prayer? UK. Allahu Akbar. MashaAllah. Serious people. Oh, yes, yes, sir. Uh, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Take the dean seriously. Huh? Take the dean seriously. Yeah, that's your excuse, huh? Take the dean seriously. We don't smile. We don't follow that sunnah. <laughs> some people, they think it's religious to not smile. So one time I, I saw this brother. I went to some airport. I don't know where in the world. I wanted to give salam to some Muslim, right? So I see this guy, Ghutra. I said, let me give this guy salam. When I came to the front, I saw his face, and he's standing alone. There's nothing there. There was a frown on his face. You couldn't put one on with, with power, what do they call that thing? Photoshop. You couldn't Photoshop a frown like that. He was like this. His whole face was here in this place. Yeah, how do you stand and stare at nothing so angry? I and mean, what could have happened? Yeah. I saw that, I was like, yeah, I don't need to, I should have given him salam. But I just like, you know what, I don't need this, I'm in a good mood, I don't need someone to ruin my mood like this. Why are you standing and frowning at nothing, yeah? People think it's a good religious brother, keep a good frown on your face. Assalamu alaikum, brother, wa alaikum, okay, alhamdulillah. <laughs> MashaAllah, wonderful, wonderful. You know, um, uh, a man came to Sufyan al Thawri, the great scholar Sufyan al Thawri, and he said, I have never seen Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, I've never seen Imam Abu Hanifa backbite anyone. So Sufyan al Thawri said, Naam, Abu Hanifa, aqal min ayyu sallat ala hasanatihi man yadhabu biha. Yani he said, Abu Hanifa is too intelligent to let someone go away, or to, yani, go away with his good deeds. What does it mean? 
It means that you backbite people, they take it from your good deeds on the day of judgment. Yeah? And this is the, this, you, want, you want a good helpful tip? Especially if you hate someone, don't backbite them. True or false? Especially if you hate someone and he did some dirty, nasty things, don't backbite them. Why? He takes your good deeds. Like, and this, okay, imagine this guy, you hate him, he's a really nasty person. So then he comes and he says, give me your, your iPad, for example, and you give him your iPad. Would you give him your iPad? No. Would you give him your, your, your laptop? Your, let's not in, in, insult the Samsung people. Your Samsung Galaxy, Mish'arif, notebook, Mish'arif, all that stuff? You wouldn't. Would you give him your, your, the best and most valuable thing to you, your good deeds? You shouldn't, right? But this is what people do now. So you backbite someone you don't like, you're giving them your good deeds, right? And that's the thing that's most beloved to you. So only backbite people you love a lot, they give them your good deeds. No, don't backbite anybody. A man, uh, Sufyan al-Thawri, again, rahimahullah, the great scholar, someone came to him and he said, these people are talking bad about you. Now, this is something great that he did. Do this next time, you hear someone's talking bad about you. Sufyan al-Thawri sent them a bowl of dates, yani a bunch of dates, with a note or a message yani, that said, it had come to my attention that you have assigned to me, and yani you have given me some of your good deeds. I couldn't find anything with which to thank you besides this bowl of dates, so please accept it from me. Okay, I'm going to say it again, pretend you're moved, okay? And this is deep stuff. I'm going to say it one more time, just make sounds like you're moved, okay? So he sent them a bowl of dates with a note that said, it, have, it has come to my attention that you have given me some of your good deeds. I couldn't find anything to thank you with except for this bowl of good dates, so please accept it from me. Thank you very much, thank you. That's, that's more like it, excellent. You, you see what he's doing? Then try it now, next time someone is bad mouthing you and stuff, just send them some candy and a note, and he, thank you very much, you know? Or send them candy and text them, you guys look, text, text them. Thank you very much for, uh, I heard you gave me some of your good deeds, please accept this candy bar from me. Try that, see if the other bad mouth you again. You know? <laughs> what are they gonna do? They're gonna come and thank you, thanks for the candy bar. <laughs> There's nothing you can say now, khalas. You destroyed this guy, right? Backbiting. Mm -hmm. Bad words. Shabab. Bad words. People think it's cool now. They think it's a good thing to use bad words. You know something? Forget the Shabab. Yeah, you run into people that supposedly quote unquote religious. You know, you go out for tea or coffee or something like that. This guy starts dropping bad words, Yahi. What happened to excuse me, Hatta? Not even excuse me. Yeah, it means that means what? When someone is using bad words and not even saying, Oh, excuse me. And it's so common for them. So many times you're around people, religious, and they're dropping bad words left and right. Tabiakhi, what is this? What happened to excuse me? It tells you how common it is in people's life. How common it is. People constantly using bad words. And I've said this before, that the angels, Allah described them as kiraman katibin. These honored creatures of Allah. Right here. Honored creatures of Allah. And they record what you say. And you use bad words and they record it. You're making these honored creatures write down bad words, profanity. You use a bad word, they write it again. Bad word, they write it again. And then on the Day of Judgment, you get your book where they write everything. And you see chapter and page and page after page after page of bad words. Page after page of bad words. If you think it's cool now to use bad words, you won't think it's cool when it comes on the Day of Judgment because you know the angels are writing everything. Allah Azza wa says, "Ma yalfidu min qawlin illa ladayhi raqibun atid." He does not utter a word except that it is written down immediately, penned down. So bad words, cursing. You know, some people think that you know what, and we can pay attention, pay attention. <laughs> Kids do things, man. <laughs> so cursing. Oh yeah, we can curse. Uh, we can curse non-Muslims. لا. The Prophet said that the believer is not li'een, yani he doesn't curse things all the time, he's not cursing all the time. So it's not from the akhlaq of the believers, from the characteristics and the mannerisms of the believers to curse anybody. Not anything, not Muslims, not non-Muslims, not trees, not dogs. People say, oh, it's, a, it's a dog, yani, najis, I can curse it. لا. Because for you, cursing is not a good khuluq. As a believer, you don't curse. People think they can curse. لا. It's a serious thing. Yani, curse meaning la'an. Yeah? To say la'ana. Yani, to, 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 what does la'an mean when you curse? Tabaan, now people use curse to mean cuss, to mean profanity. But we're meaning cursing here to invoke the 
la'an of Allah Azza wa which means what? You're asking, you're saying, may Allah send you away from His mercy. Okay, if we think about this dua against someone, would, would you want to say this to anyone? First of all, would you ever want to say this to a Muslim? May Allah send you away from His mercy. Would you say this to a Muslim? Taib, imagine, okay, it's a kafir in the street and uh, whatever, you have the traffic thing or he just, you know, didn't open the door for and you say, Akh Allah al-anak ya. May Allah curse this man. You're saying, may Allah send you away from his mercy. Taib, would you rather that or would you rather this person be guided to Islam, for example? If this person caught on fire in front of you, would you, would you just laugh and walk away? Taib, you're just asking, you're asking Allah to put him in the hellfire. And muhim cursing. Bad words, all these things, not from the akhlaq of the believers. And be, even being rude to people. I mean, wallahi, I don't know why. Some people think if they're religious, that means it gives them the right to be rude to people when giving advice. Being rude to people, if the peop person is doing something haram, I can be rude to them because he's doing haram. Where did you get this rule from? Not you, yani, but generally, where did you get this rule from? A man came to Harun al-Rashid. Harun al-Rashid was the, one of the khulafa and he was... He was uh, yani very studious and he was well read, you know, he was into reading and stuff. He was like knowledgeable Khalifa, not unlike others like Mutawakkil, for example, just a soldier, you know, yani and others. So a man comes to Harun al-Rashid to give him nasiha. Now this is Amir al-Mu'mineen, the Khalifa, right? And he has an opportunity to give this man good advice. No, the man comes and gives him harsh, 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 harsh advice. So Harun al-Rashid tells him something very nice. He said, Ya Rajul, Irfiq, yani, oh man. Irfiq, be gentle. فَقَدْ بَعَثَ اللَّهُ مَنْ هُوَ خَيْرٌ مِّنْكَ إِلَى مَنْ هُوَ شَرٌ مِّنِّي فَأَمَرَهُ بِالْلِينَ He's saying, be gentle. Allah sent a man better than you to someone worse than me and he still told him to be gentle. Who's he talking about? Musa alayhi salam, right? Allah Azza wa Jalla tells Musa and Harun فَقُولَ لَهُ قَوْلًا لَيِّنَا To speak to him a gentle speech. Perhaps he may be reminded. So he's saying, Musa was better than you, and he was sent to Fir'aun who's worse than me, but still Musa was asked to be gentle with him. So what makes you think you can just come and be rude to me? So beware, beware, brothers. Beware of being harsh and being rude to the believers, and being you know, harsh with them just because they have not been guided, or just because Allah guided you, and they're doing something that's in the haram, so you come harsh, frowning. That's why if you talk to most if I can use the term, non-religious Muslims, they, do they like religious people? <laughs> Talk to them if you, don't, if you don't think so. They don't like religious people, why? Ya akhi, these religious people, frowning all the time, everything haram, haram, haram. And that's what they do, don't they? That's the yani, favorite word now, haram. Brother, haram. Ya akhi, tayyib, salam alaykum, awal shi, yani, haram, haram. And what is this? And since when were we sent to rectify like this? And the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, bashiru, right? Wala? Tunafiru, yassiru wala tuassiru. He said, give glad tidings and don't send people away. Yeah? He said, yassiru, make things easy and don't make things difficult. This was the way of the Prophet So we've got now, we've got lying, we've got backbiting, we've got bad words, we've got harsh or rude speech, rude words. And we have, يعني, يعني when it comes to things like that, it, it, it doesn't even just has to be actual, have to be actual speech that you make, but it could be sometimes written, and we'll consider that as part of speech. The Prophet ﷺ said, the beginning hadith, yeah, the one that this lecture is, is titled after, مَنْ كَانَ يُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ فَلْيَقُلْ خَيْرًا أَوْ لِيَصْمُتْ Whoever believes in Allah in the last day, he should say that which is good, or he should be quiet. Look at, for example, on the internet, how people go back and forth. Yeah, they're not speaking, but they're typing. It's the equivalent of it. They're expressing يعني, what would have been otherwise in speech. Now it's being typed. Look at the forums. I thought, يعني, I was very hopeful that this young generation of Muslims now, they don't have the fighting and stuff that, you know, people come with fighting from back home and they start to fight over here, right? I said, inshallah, the new generation won't fight. Then I discovered a few months ago something called the forums. La ilaha illallah. Shabab at each other's throats, attacking each other left and right, left and right, refuting. Man, who are you? You're refuting. Guy is 16 years old, refuting. Refuting what? Yeah, go kill the mosquito on your forehead or something. Refuting that. Uh, this is our, it, it's our duty to expose the mubtadi'a. I'm sorry. Weren't you wetting your bed <laughs> two years ago? <laughs> you know, I, I'm not nice with these things, right? Yeah, and what is this? 
And who told you this is your job? You know something? People take things out of, all out of context. One time, this is a true, this is a narration about Ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma. Ibn Umar, a man came to him and he said, Ibn Umar, I love you for the sake of Allah. And Ibn Umar tells him, and I hate you for the sake of Allah. Okay, now, first of all, before we think we can say this to someone in the masjid, because people read the narration like this, they say, oh, I can say this too. And one of the brothers, one, he said it to someone before. I hate you for the sake of Allah. Who are you again? 18, 19 year old, you hate me for the, I'm not going to sleep tonight because you hate me. Who cares? This is the difference between you saying it and Ibn Umar, when Ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma, he was now an old man, one of the few companions alive, because now as in the later generations, few companions are alive. And they are the ulama, he's the alim, and an old man, and the companion. You see how people respect him now, right? So if he wanted to reprimand someone severely, he could say something harsh, and because he's an old man and a scholar and a companion, people would see it as an admonition for everyone else, as a warning for everyone else. That's all. So if Ibn Umar tells someone, you know, I hate you for the sake of Allah because you did some bid'ah, everyone now is aware, oh, I shouldn't do this bid'ah. Because Ibn Umar said a strong word, so it's a, it becomes a warning for everyone, an admonition that travels. But some young guy comes in the masjid, Ya Akhi, enter the masjid with your left, with your right, uh -huh, I hate you for the sake of Allah. <laughs> Who are you exactly? Yeah? Harshness, harshness, harshness. It's nothing to do with being religious whatsoever. Being rude, being harsh has nothing to do with being religious. And Nabi Sallallahu was told by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala in the Quran, وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضًّا غَلِيدَ الْقَلْبِ لَمْ فَضُّوا مِنْ حَوْلِكَ And if you were with them, harsh and crude, hard-hearted with them, they would have scattered from around you. These great companions, these are, they had the best hearts. The hearts that would most accept a good message and the best message is the Quran. But we learn from this verse that if the best message, the Quran, came to the best hearts with bad manners and bad presentation, these best hearts wouldn't accept it. That's really profound, isn't it? Yes, no? Five, thank you. <laughs> Two guys, okay. So, <laughs> you're, we're to speak good, part, it's part of who we are, right? We're to speak well and, and use good speech even if it's w with a non-Muslim. Even if it's with someone who is aggressive, someone who is aggressive, yeah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes Ibadur Rahman in the Quran, the servants, uh, the, the slaves of Ar-Rahman. And he says, وَإِذَا خَاطَبَهُمُ الْجَاهِلُونَ قَالُوا سَلَامًا and if the ignorant address them, طبعاً, address them in a harsh way, in an aggressive way, their response is salama, with words of peace, yani peaceful words. They give them back good words. They don't give them equal, which is what people think now. Wallahi, he was rude to me, so I was rude to him. La. Or he said bad word to me, so I gave him bad words to him. And I mentioned his mother also. Yeah? La. Because... What, because what happens is that uh, the way human beings communicate is they always emulate the way the other person speaks. So for example, if someone comes to you and they start whispering, what will you do? We'll st you start whispering. If in the masjid someone tells you, Assalamu alaikum brother, you will say yes, wa alaikum salam. Immediately you start to whisper. And if someone comes to you and starts yelling, shabab, pay attention. If someone comes to you and starts yelling, you're going to start yelling immediately. Yeah? Because people reciprocate. But if we know that people reciprocate, why should I allow that person to bring me down to a bad level of speaking? Why don't I speak at a good level and he will reciprocate? You understand? Yeah, and if someone comes yelling at you, you don't have to yell back. You start speaking calmly and guess what will happen? He will start to speak calmly as well. And there's no way he's going to continue yelling and you're speaking at whispering tone. At some point, you guys are going to find a way to bring the conversation to another place. So don't allow people control over your life. You're having a good day. You're in a great mood. Someone walks by you. He's in a bad mood. He's having a bad day. Is that your problem? Is it? But he can make it your problem. All he has to do is just say something rude to you. Suddenly you're saying something rude back and you're yelling. And in a second you change your mood. And then when you get to wherever you're going, you go there angry. This guy came to me. He has a bad day. You had a great day. You prayed Fajr on time. You had English breakfast. Yeah? You had, everything was good for you. Why should you ruin your day? Why would you allow this stranger so much control over you? Does it make sense? Yeah. Never allow people so much control over you. Um, sometimes you speak 
And you're not necessarily lying or backbiting or spreading rumors or cursing or cussing. But you just speak and speak and speak and speak and speak and speak and just keep speaking. <laughs> you know something? And you've probably all seen if someone speaks too much, what happens? You're about to die, right? When someone speaks too much. Yes or true or false? <laughs> when someone speaks a lot, it's, too, it's horrible. One time we went on this trip for 12 hours. And there was this brother for 12 hours, man. He's speaking. And he's speaking very quickly, like he has so much important information to get out. He was speaking so quickly that he's breathing quickly to continue speaking. So, 12 hours and we're khalas, Allah, Allah, Allah. So then we stop at the next stop. Everybody wants out of that car, to, they had a car and a van. Everybody wants out of the car to go into the van. <laughs> and I'll tell you the truth. I start to get into the van. Zakallah khair, Shaykh. I start to get into the van. He started to get into the van. When he got into the van, I got out of the van, went to the car. And everybody wanted to escape. And that's why, <laughs> that's why Amr ibn al-As, the companion of Allah, he used to say, Al-Kalamu kaddawa. Speaking, okay, talking is like medicine. In aqlalta minhu nafa, wa in aktharta minhu qatal. He said, speaking is like medicine. If a little of it will cure, and a lot of it kills. True, isn't it? And the, the Arabs had the saying, they used to say, keeping silent preserves reverence. Yeah, and people revere you when you're quiet a lot of the time. You're always talking, ta -ta 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 -ta. no one has the, any high regard for you. Like, oh, it's this guy, yeah? But you stay quiet. Even, sometimes you stay quiet, even if there's nothing here, people think there's something here. Because the one has the waqar all the time. Like you British people all the time. In America, we always think British people are very smart. Because the way when you guys speak, especially the Queen's English, yeah? It sounds smart, yeah? <laughs> it sounds very smart. Anyways, let's pass on. You guys, we can't joke with each other, huh? We're not friends like that? So one is always my friends. What happened this time? Pakistanis were brothers anyways, right? Am I right? I mean, Pakistani origin. You guys aren't really Pakistani. You're, you're all British, but, but originally, yani, we're buddies, right? Okay, khalas. You know. you know, I lived in Islamabad five years. and Yeah, man. Best city in Pakistan, Islamabad. All right, anyways. Let's move on since you guys are so serious. Yeah. <laughs> but you know something? Yeah, you stay quiet, people immediately revere you. Yeah. And they say this person, mashallah, muhtaram, respectable guy. <laughs> you know, I think you all know that story at the time of Imam, Ibn, uh, Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, when he used to see this man and the man would dress well and he'd be quiet. So he thought this man, mashallah, here is full. So Imam Abu Hanifa used to respect this man. Every time this man came to the gathering, he would bring his feet in, he would sit properly. He wanted to extend his feet and relax, but he sees this respectable man, he would bring it in. Then one day the man spoke. <laughs> he made the mistake and he spoke. So he comes to Imam Abu Hanifa and he asked him about fasting. He said, yeah, Imam, yeah, when do we fast? He said, well, you start fasting when the sun comes up and you break the fast when the sun goes down. So then he asked his next question. He said, what if the sun doesn't come up? <laughs> so immediately the Imam stretched out his legs. He said, now it's time for Imam Abu Hanifa to stretch his legs. For Abu Hanifa to put out his khalas, يعني. but when he was quiet, he was respectable. Oh well, the minute, the minute he spoke, he was like, what is this? Yeah, and you know, people love to ask Mashaikh these strange questions. <coughs> strange questions. Like one of the one of the Mashaikh was asked, if I get yeah, Sheikh, if I get a big tray, and I put all kinds of human excre excrement in it, and gather it full of human excrement, urine and this and that, huh? and then I carry this tray from here. To there and I put it down. Will that negate my wudu? <laughs> the Sheikh told him, gather all this stuff on the tray, then come ask me the question. I'll give you an answer, inshallah. <laughs> hey, when are you ever gonna encounter something like that? You know? Keeping the tongue, subhanAllah. So we're talking about typing, yeah? We didn't even finish that part. Forums, people fighting left and right, calling each other mubtadi'een, all this, no manners, no akhlaq, no adab, and they think yani, this is for the sake of Allah. Who made you the, the policeman? Yani the, the, the taqwa police, who made you taqwa police? Yeah? People bad mouthing constantly, you know, even on YouTube now. People watch a video and just immediately start attacking and insulting. The video can be about akhlaq and down underneath it, people fighting. People can be a, a video as, about peace and Muslims are fighting underneath it. You mubtada, you like that. <laughs> ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. And you think, my, mashallah, these people have standards. One time, I watched, and this was actually a, a Somali young man about your age, you guys. This was, we were at a conference, and I told you, I go to all Somali conferences, man. Usually we're friends, me and Somalis. 
I don't know what's happening here, Mr. Tawfiq. <laughs> Usually we're good friends, right? <laughs> and Muhim, so this young Somali man about your age, he came up and he recited some Quran before the conference, and he, before the lecture started. He recited some Quran, he had a nice voice, mashallah. And he made a small mistake. Mafia, she, he's like, what, nine or ten. He made a small mistake. And they put the video up on YouTube. And this brother commented some severe comment. Everyone else, mashallah, a nice voice. One guy said, this is not acceptable. This boy made a mistake. And it's not acceptable to put a video like this of the Quran with a mistake in it. And you should take this video down immediately. And I said, man, this man must have some strict, strict, strict standards. So I clicked on his name. I thought maybe he's got some channel, you know, learn something from this guy. You know, when you go on YouTube now, you click on someone's name. It shows you the last videos they watched and the comments they put. When I saw the video he was watching, the last one, I was like, La ilaha illallah. <laughs> I'm even ashamed to describe it. There was some Latino woman dancing in very bad clothing. And he's putting comments, muchos buenos. I don't know. I don't, <laughs> I don't speak Spanish, yani, but I was like, look at this guy. You know, you know what I call that? I call it E-man. You know what I'm talking about? E as in electronic, like email. This is E man. I like that name. I'm proud of that. I made that up myself. Okay, how about this? I'm going to stop, yeah? I'm going to stop. And then uh, you let me know. What, what happened to the timekeeper, man? Keep on, keep on. Uh, yeah, five minutes, but khalas, I'm out of stuff, yeah. You want me to keep making stuff up or what? So I'm going to stop and, and uh, allow some of the mashaykh if they want to comment and if the youth also have questions. So Zakmullah Khairan for being an attentive audience. Sallallahu Mubarak Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.